An excerpt from St. Siloan the Athenite, written by Elder Sofroni Sakharov, originally published in 1991 by the Patriarchal Stratopedic Monastery of St. John the Baptist, Tulshan Knights, Malden, Essex, England. The Chapter 10, Spiritual Trials. Man does not always find it easy with God. In the generally much prolonged periods when grace abandons the soul, God may appear a merciless tyrant. When all his efforts, often pushed to extreme limits, fail to obtain divine mercy, man suffers so acutely that were it possible he would renounce existence in any form. What then is the nature of this suffering? Not an easy question to answer. Once having cognized God, having experienced life in the light radiating from the divine countenance, the soul no longer finds peace or satisfaction in any reality of this world, while at the same time she is surrounded by everything except God. Everything she recognizes as evil, as darkness, as demonic action, tosses her about. Sometimes the torture inflicted by the passions is so intense that it seems as if God had abandoned man and now paid no heed to his appeals. Like the most helpless creature, he hangs suspended over the frightful abyss and cries to God for help, but all his cries remain unheeded. God seems indifferent to all his sufferings. The soul is aware that she has turned away from God's love and her iniquity and betrayal torture her. Nevertheless, she implores him to have pity on her, but in vain. God merely indicts the soul, and she is weary of such accusations. She recognizes the justice of the divine judgment, but that by no means lessens her sufferings. It is not her imagination. She really is plunged into the shadow of death, and not finding by her side the God whom she invokes day and night, she suffers intolerably. One asks oneself, where is the sense in all of this? During the times of trial, the soul cannot accept it as a sign of divine mercy or of God's confidence in her, as his desire to associate man with holiness and fullness of being in himself. The soul knows only one thing, that God has abandoned her after manifesting his light, thereby vastly magnifying her misery. And when... At the end of her strength, she does not behold God leaning mercifully toward her. Such thoughts and sentiments assault her concerning which it is better to remain silent. The soul descends into hell, but not like those who do not know the divine spirit, who do not possess the light of the true knowledge of God and, and so are, are blind. No, she descends into hell capable of discerning the nature of the darkness she beholds. This only happens to those who, having known divine grace, have then lost it. The seed of divine love which the soul bears in her depths then engenders repentance so powerful, so total, as to surpass the measure of ordinary religious consciousness. Shedding abundant tears, man turns to God with his whole being, with his whole strength, and so learns true prayer, which detaches him from this world, introducing him into another world where he hears words which no human language can express, ineffable words, since once translated into current concepts, he who hears them can only see and hear what he knows from his own experience. When the soul has gone through this whole gamut of harsh testing, she perceives clearly in herself that there is no place in the world no tribulation, no joy, no force, no creature that could separate her from the love of God. See Romans 8.35 The shades of night can no longer swallow up the light of this life. Man does not always find it easy with God. Similarly, it is not always easy to live with a saint. Many imagine naively that contact with saints must be pleasant and full of joy. They complain that they are surrounded by sinners and dream of encountering a saint. From the odd encounter which 
may have filled the downcast soul with the light of hope and renewed strength, they hasten to conclude that living among the saints always has the same exhilarating effect on the soul. Not so. No saint could release us from the obligation to struggle against the sin in us. He can assist by his prayers, help with the word of counsel, strengthened by his example, but he cannot release us from the harsh necessity for personal struggle and sacrifice. And when a saint exhorts and summons us to live according to the commandments of Christ, he may seem hard. Was it not said, and to this day is it not said of Christ himself, that his is a hard saying, who can hear it? John six sixty. So likewise, when the saints demand that we keep the commandments in all their purity, we find it beyond our strength and hard. Starat Siloan was always gentle, indulgent, and good, but he never deviated from what God had taught him. His attitude was simple and plain. The Lord feels pity for all men. He so loved man that he took upon himself the burden of the whole world, and from us he would, he would that, that we love our brethren. Listening to the starets, one knew with his one's whole soul that he was speaking truth. But to follow him is beyond us. And many have abandoned him. The spiritual fragrance that emanated from him generated profound shame for oneself and a sense of one's own stench and vileness. If you moaned against people who affronted you, he would understand how you felt and sympathize with you, but not share your wrath. If you thought to return evil for evil, he would be distressed over you. If you considered it detrimental to repay the bad man with the good, he could not understand how you who called yourself a Christian could think that something done in accordance with Christ's commandment might in any way be damaging. For him, Christ's commandments were the law of absolute perfection and the unique way to subjugate the evil in the world and to lead to eternal light. Keeping the commandments can only be profitable, profitable alike for him who obeys and the one on the receiving end. No, there can be no circumstances in which following Christ's commandments could be harmful. If one envisions harm, not from a temporal angle, but on the plane of eternal being, for Christ's commandments is the expression of absolute good. A hero monk once remarked to the starts that to act as he said would be to the enemy's advantage and so evil would triumph. The starts was silent for a moment because his, interlo his interlocutor locutor was incapable of understanding what he might say. But later on he remarked to another monk, Could the Spirit of Christ wish ill on anyone? Is that what God has called us to? In the man dominated by the passions, the malice in his conscience is both extreme and subtle. In the spiritual life, the man possessed by passion often passes it off as, as a disinterested search for truth and profit, sometimes even as combat for the glory of God. In the name of Christ, who gave himself up to the death for the sake of his enemies, people are sometimes ready to shed blood, though not their own blood, but that of their brother enemy. It has been so all down the centuries, but the starts his life coincided with a moment in history when this perversion attained exceptional force. Can this be the way of Christ? He would remark sadly. The starts' his message is a hard one. Who can hear it? To live according, accordingly is to deliver oneself over to martyrdom, not only in the primary sense of the word, but martyrdom in everyday life. I cannot at the moment remember where it is that we are told about a pious man who all his life pleaded with God to accord him a martyr's death, and when the hour came for his peaceful end, he said, Sadly, my prayer has not been heard. But scarcely had he uttered the words when he was apprised inside himself that his whole life had been a martyrdom and was accepted as martyrdom. The start said, that the grace he had received at the outset was comparable with the grace of martyrs, so that he even thought that perhaps the Lord was reserving a martyr's death for him. But as the pious man he was, he died peacefully. He was to the highest degree, sober in all things. 
He did not give himself over to daydreaming about perfection, but having known Christ's perfect love, he spent his whole life in an intense effort to acquire it. More than anyone else, he knew that the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Matthew 26, 41. Which is why he remarked that people were to be met who, with who wanted to suffer for Christ, but without grace in the body. Two, one might not be able to bear martyrdom. This is why we would we should not audaciously engage in such asceticism. But if it but if the Lord summons us to do so, we must pray for his help and he will help us. The Starts did not seek martyrdom, even though he knew the grace of the martyrs. Nevertheless, his life was a veritable martyrdom, one could even say, worse than martyrdom. Sometimes a martyr will pay with his life for a brief period of confessing his faith. But to live long years of ascetic life, long years of praying for the world, as he did, to pray for the people is to shed blood, is greater than simple martyrdom. The way of the Christian always means martyrdom. He who rightly follows it is reluctant to preach it. His soul is full of the desire to see his brother, a communicant in eternal light, but the suffering he would bear alone. And so, before and above all else, the Christian devotes himself to prayer for the world. Within the boundaries of earthly life, in this sphere set aside by God for the manifestation of the possibilities, not just positive but negative likewise, of freedom, no one and nothing can altogether arrest the manifestation of evil. The prayer of love, however, is powerful enough to modify the course of events and diminish the scale of evil. The life is the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. John 1, 4-5 The darkness of non-being cannot black out the light of life. All the good that proceeds from God and returns to God is indestructible. Prayer is one of the highest forms of ontological good, indestructible, eternal. It is that good part which shall not be taken away. Luke 10.42 In the quest after salvation for himself and his brethren, the ascetic concentrates on his inner man, becomes aware in himself of the powerfulness of the law of sin, Romans 7.23, seeing how sin slays him, See, Romans 7.11 In spite of all his exertions to do good, he not seldom reaches the limits of despair. And in this painful state takes to prayer. I remember one memorable visit. A monk, a hermit, came to see us. He was about 75 years of old. He lived at a deserted spot between the monastery and the hermitage in the ravine by a stream in the wood. His face Ravaged all wrinkles, looked gray and long unwashed. The dark gray hair of his head and beard looked dirty. His grayish blue eyes were sunk deep in their sockets. We had a long talk with him, and this is what he, what he told us. Quote, it is many years now that my soul suffers when I think of us monks. We have renounced the world, left our parents and our motherland, given up everything that usually constitutes life for people. We have pronounced our vows before God, the holy angels, and our brethren to live according to Christ's law. We have renounced our own will and, in effect, lead a martyr's life. And still we make no progress towards goodness. Will many of us be saved? I shall be the first to perish. I see others, too, who are slaves to their passions. And when I meet people of the world, I see that they live in profound ignorance, listless and unrepentant. And thus, little by little, without even noticing, I was drawn to pray for the world. The thought distressed me that if we monks who have renounced the world do not find salvation, what must it be like in the world? My sorrow gradually increased, and I started weeping tears of despair. And now, last year, when I was in such despair, tired of weeping, lying face down on the floor, the Lord appeared to me and asked, Why weepest thou? I was silent. 
Dost thou not know that it is I who will judge the world? I still kept silent. The Lord says, I will have mercy on every man who, if only once in his life, has called upon God. The thought crossed my mind. So what is the use of us tormenting ourselves day after day? To which the Lord replied, Those who suffer because of my commandment will be my friends in the kingdom of heaven. The others I will merely have mercy upon. With this the Lord retired. End of quote. This happened when he was awake. He went on to tell us of two visions that had come when he was in a light sleep after sorrowful prayer for the world. I'm not going to mention the name of this monk because he's still alive, nor will I attempt to appraise his vision. I listened impassively, not reacting to his story in accordance with the strict rule for monks on Manathos to be especially guarded where visions are concerned. Perhaps it was this dry caution or some stupidity on my part that alienated the old monk. In any case, he never came again. True, the pretentious idea had occurred to me to probe him further. Perhaps he felt hurt. I do not know. During my time on the holy mountain, I met nine monks who gladly prayed for the world, shedding tears as they prayed. On one occasion, I heard this discussion between two of them. The first said, I cannot understand why the Lord does not grant peace to the world, even if only a single person implored him to do so. To which the other replied, And how could there be complete peace in the world if but a single malicious man remained? But let us return now to our subject. God is not always easy for man. I repeat myself, but our theme makes repetition inevitable. The ascetic's range of thought is neither rich nor varied. He is concerned with a sphere of being not easily assimilated. Centuries go by, and the same experience recurs almost incidentally. Yet few people recognize the pattern of Christian progress, and they lose their way. The Lord said, Straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Matthew 7.14 let us return once more to the subject that engaged start Siloan and Father Strakonikos in long discussion. The spiritual way for the Christian, broadly speaking, presents itself like this. At the outset, man is drawn to God by the gift of grace, and once attracted, a prolonged period of testing sets in. His freedom as a man and his trust in God are put to the test, sometimes harshly, at the initial stage of his conversion His prayers, urgent or not so urgent, are miraculously granted almost before they are uttered. But when the time of trial starts, everything alters. It seems as if heaven had closed up and become deaf to all our prayers. For the fervent Christian, everything in life gets to be difficult. There is a change in people's attitude towards him. He is no longer respected. What is willingly forgiven others is held against is. What is willingly forgiven, others is held against him. His resistance to physical ills is lowered. Nature, circumstances, people all turn against him. He finds no outlet for his natural talents, though they are no less valuable than other people's. On top of all this, he has to endure assaults from the demonic powers. And finally, the most painful and unbearable of torments, God deserts him. His suffering is complete. He is stricken on every level of his being. Does God abandon men? Surely this is not possible. Yet instead of a sense of God's proximity, the soul now feels that he is infinitely, inaccessibly far away, farther than the stellar worlds, and all appeals to him are lost in space. Inside herself, the soul doubles her invocations, but sees neither help nor even that they are noticed. Everything is painful. It seems that nothing can be achieved without disproportionate effort, strenuous beyond human strength. Life becomes a calvary, and there is a feeling that God's curse and wrath have descended on the soul. But later, when this ordeal is over, he will realize how carefully this ineffable, wondrous divine providence has preserved him on his every path. 
millenary experience from generation to generation down the ages testifies that when God sees the ascetic's fidelity to him, as he remarked that of Job, he conducts him into abysses and up to heights inaccessible to any other man. The more unshakable the ascetic's loyalty and trust in God, the greater will be the measure of his testing and the more complete his experience, which may reach the ultimate limits attainable by man. So long as pride is deeply rooted in him, man is subject to particularly painful, hellish despair that distorts his every notion of God and the ways of his providence. The proud soul, plunged in the torments and shades of hell, sees God as the cause of her sufferings and considers him immeasurably cruel. Deprived of true life in God, she sees everything through the spectrum of her own crippled state and begins to detest both her own life and in general everything that exists in the world. Outside the divine light, in her despair, she begins to consider even the existence of God himself as hopeless absurdity. And so her estrangement from God and her detestation of everything that exists grows and grows. People of faith escape this despair, this hatred, because it is through faith that man is saved. Through faith in the love and compassion of God, faith in his word, faith in the witness of the fathers of the church. Probably the majority of devout Christians in the course of their lives have not experienced their own resurrection, but they believe in it and their faith preserves them. The Starts often spoke of this faith, quoting the Lord's words, Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. John twenty twenty nine. The hour will come when this faith will lead man out of the cramped darkness of bondage into the vast expanse of true, imperishable life, the splendor of which is quite incomparable with our usual ideas of splendor and beauty. The devil treats in a different manner those who yield to him and those who resist. The suffering occasioned by the despair that arises out of pride differs from that of the pious soul when God allows Satan to wage war against her. The latter form of temptation is extremely painful and only rarely permitted. When man, for the first time deliberately abandoned by God, senses the approach of Satan, his whole being, soul and body, suffers immense distress and terror not to be compared with the fear caused by the approach of criminals and murderers for it is the black night of eternal damnation. The soul that knows exactly what the devil is, appreciates the force of his cruelty, and shocked by the colossal evil confronting her, shrinks into herself. So undone by the horror, the despair, and alarm that have taken possession of her, she has no strength left for prayer. She has no sense of God as her shield. And the enemy says to her, You are in my power. Put not your trust in God, forget him. He cannot be inclined to mercy. At such moments, the soul, unwilling to give in to the devil, either Im immobilizes herself, still, silent, in the thought of God, or else, in better cases, finds in herself the strength to invoke the divine name. It is only later on that she will realize with what solicitude God inclined unto her in the hour of combat. From the Starts' writings, we, sh we shall see that twice he had to wage this sort of struggle against Satan. The first time he was saved by repeating the Jesus prayer. Before he had finished, the Lord appeared to him. On the second occasion, more practiced and courageous, he found the strength to sit down and turn towards God and pray. Then it was that he heard in response the strange, wor strange words, Keep thy mind in hell and despair not. Then it was that he knew how to arm himself against the devil, at whose every approach the soul must turn on herself all the fire of self-hatred, and like her worst enemy, condemn herself to eternal torment, repeating all the time, but God is holy, true, and blessed throughout all ages. Armed with this weapon, the soul rids herself of all fear and becomes impervious to all evil. At the enemy's every attack, she casts herself wrathfully into the abyss of eternal darkness, judging herself deserving of such punishment, and the enemy then retires, unable to bear the violence 
of the fire blazing in the soul. And the soul, rid of harm, can turn to God and pray with a pure spirit. The enemy fell through pride. Pride is the source of sin, composing every aspect that evil can assume. Conceit, ambition, indifference, cruelty, disregard of the suffering of others, daydreaming, over-fantasizing, a demented expression in the eye, in every other feature, gloom, melancholy, despair, animosity, envy, an inferiority complex, carnal desires, wearisome psychological disturbance, re rebellious feelings, fear of death, or on the contrary, wanting to put an end to life, and lastly, and not seldom, utter madness. These are the indications of demonic spirituality. But until they show up clearly, they pass unnoticed for many. It does not need all these symptoms to denote someone who has let himself be seduced by satanic thoughts or visions or revelations. In some people, megalomania predominates, or ambition. With others, nostalgia, despair, hidden anxiety, and still others it is envy, gloom, hatred. With many it is the desires of the flesh. But they all suffer from unbridled imagination and pride, masked maybe by an air of false humility. When a man lets himself be seduced by the enemy and sets out to follow him, not realizing what the enemy is, he does not appreciate the harshness of the combat, and so suffers, not realizing that the enemy is seducing him from the light of true life into his own benighted habitat. Such suffering bears the imprint of spiritual blindness. In some cases, the enemy will convey an uneasy delight at the thought of illusory grandeur. In others, he provokes acute pain in the soul, inciting her against God. And then the soul, not perceiving the real cause of her agony, turns against God in hatred. A pious soul, however, that has come to know the love of God in the straight fight against the enemy suffers from the immensely baleful power for evil that the devil directs against her. She is well aware that this force could utterly destroy her. In the first instance, the soul generally struggles for a long time without finding the issue that will lead her to God. In the second case, God appears to man in great light. So soon as the time of testing is over, the duration and intensity of which is measured by God. For some, it lasts several minutes, with others an hour or more. And for one ascetic, it went on for three days. The duration may depend for the one part on the intensity of the struggle and on the other, the degree of the soul's endurance, for not all souls are equally strong. There is no more powerful temptation than this battle against Satan. The tribulation exceeds every other possible calamity. Yet, there is still a worse form of suffering. The suffering of the soul wounded to her very depths with the love for God and yet not attaining him whom she seeks. How incom incomprehensible the manner in which God treats the soul. After generating ardent love in her, in a mysterious manner he steals away. And when the soul can no longer bear being abandoned, then he softly returns with his ineffable consolation. At times the torment of feeling abandoned by God is worse than all the torments of hell, but it differs in that it has within itself life-giving divine strength capable of transforming affliction into the sweet blessedness of the love of God. So long as he is burdened by the flesh, man cannot continue steady and unyielding. Now and again the soul of the ascetic engaged in pure prayer touches upon genuine eternal life, her ultimate and unique aim. But when this prayer comes to an end, the soul sinks to a state of being either just faintly aware of God or even centrally affected by the world. The body is impervious to light and the feeling of the presence of God loses its intensity. Many people are so obsessed by their sensory perceptions as practically to know no others and then they become this flesh themselves, turning their backs on the law of God. But for an ascetic to fall from pure prayer into the op opacity of a sensual approach to the world means that he is distancing himself from the Lord. The Apostle Paul says, Whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. 
we are willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 6 and 8. Only by uninterrupted effort can the ascetic preserve himself from the humiliation to which the flesh constantly drags him down. And the more frequently his spiritual moods recur and the longer they last, the more painful it is for him when he falls back to a sensual approach to the world. When an ascetic, moved by the, the spirit of divine love, prays with profound weeping for the world and reaches the highest state possible for him at that moment, he feels peace of spirit due to his nearness to God. But when his prayer comes to an end, the peace lasts a certain while, sometimes longer, sometimes shorter, after which the agitation starts up again. These alternating states lead to different results. As a certain stage on their spiritual path, some ascetics may attain to a measure of prayer that plunges their soul into fear and trembling, after which they gradually retreat and allow their prayer to weaken. Other more valiant souls, on the contrary, unwearyingly continue to develop, seeking ever more fullness of prayer. And so it goes on until their desire, their sine qua non, even, not to spare themselves, to de detest and destroy their own life, is implanted deep in their being. But even this, as we see in the starts' his writings, is still not the supreme love that the Lord communicates to his servants, for the sweetness of which man can lightly bear any suffering, even death itself. Blessed start, Siloan knew without the faintest shadow of a doubt that the love taught, taught him by the Holy Spirit is truth, whose intrinsic authenticity is beyond question. He had realized this at the time the Lord appeared to him. He would say that when the Lord manifests himself to the soul, it is impossible for the soul not to recognize in him her creator and God. Through the action of the Holy Spirit, it was given to the starts to contemplate the perfect holiness of God, and with his whole heart, his whole being, he strove to be joined with to acquire this sanctity. It is impossible for one who follows this path to indulge in abstract rational cog cognition even concerning the mysteries of the faith. His soul avoids all discursive argument, leading to a peculiar disintegration of the unity and integrality of the life of the Spirit, panting in prayer after God. Constant preoccupation with prayer distracts the mind from the outside world, and were it not for habit formed down the years, everyday tasks would be impossible. The soul from love of the Lord has lost her wits. She sits in silence, with no wish to speak, and looks upon the world with mazed eyes, having no desire for it and seeing it not. And people do not know that she is contemplating her beloved Lord, that the world has been left behind and is forgotten, for there is no sweetness therein. I mean, end of chapter 10.